Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the front row. I'm here in my home uh, to host this uh, front row lecture where we have Arnab Chatterjee, uh, who is going to tell us about the latest drug screening efforts. Uh, before that, I'd just like to say a little bit about Scripps Research. Maybe some of you uh, aren't so familiar. We have a, over a thousand people. I know we have someone from as far away as Aruba logging in. Uh, hopefully we have people on both the East and the West Coast and maybe even around the world. Uh, Scripps has two campuses, one here in La Jolla and we have our companion campus out in Jupiter, Florida. There's over 200 faculty in those labs in departments such as chemistry, immunology, structural biology, neuroscience, and molecular medicine. It's a truly interdisciplinary uh, campus. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of is our PhD program. We are uh, accredited for uh, awarding the doctoral degrees. We have about 200 students and we're ranked by US News World Report in the top 10 in both chemistry and biology. Now, one of the things that, um, oh, here I am. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, we're particularly proud of here at Scripps is that we've been doing virus research for decades. And a lot of it has been in the area of influenza and HIV. And now we are basically well positioned because of all of that experience to tackle uh, problems in, that really face us now in a critical way concerning the, the novel coronavirus. So Scripps has a long standing history of developing medicines that address serious diseases in human health and bringing those to market. Uh, we're really happy to announce that in March, we had uh, ozanamide, which was a drug developed at Scripps for uh, treating multiple sclerosis, was approved by the FDA. Uh, we have a number of other medicines that, that are shown in the slide. I don't have time to go through them. Uh, we could have a whole seminar about that, but uh, there, there's a long history of bringing drugs to market, and that gives us a, a good context to think about what Arnab is going to tell us about today. So really, the work going on at Scripps can be organized into what we're calling the Global Health Initiative. And this consists of efforts by many, many investigators in the three organizational arms of Scripps. We have the Scripps Research, which is all of the academic departments. We have the Scripps Research Translational Institute led by Dr. Eric Topol that does digital medicine. And then uh, we also have the Caliber arm, which is the drug discovery arm founded by our president, Pete Schultz. And Arnab is one of the lead investigators at Caliber. But in the Global Health Initiative, when we think about uh, addressing current pandemic, there's really three main thrusts of the work. One is to detect, one is to prevent, and the other is to treat. So detection involves uh, surveillance, so sequencing, finding the virus, and then diagnostics, so testing for uh, presence of the virus or presence of antibodies. Uh, we're also developing vaccines here at Scripps, which are ultimately going to be what controls this. And then the third pillar of this effort is antiviral therapy, so drugs that can interfere with viral function and be used to tra treat inf infected patients. We've had a series of lectures in the front row. Uh, this RNABS is the third in a series. So our first one was uh, two weeks ago. That was Christian Anderson, who's part of SRTI and Scripps Research. And he's a, a, one of the experts in the world at tracking viral pandemics and building a family tree of uh, all of the uh, viral sequences to understand how the virus has spread. Uh, last week, we heard uh, from Mark, uh, Mike Farzan, who's uh, in the Florida campus, and he's talking about ways that they're developing to develop vaccines. And that's a parallel effort with Dennis Burden on the La Jolla campus uh, and his large group working on vaccines. And so that brings me to today. So Arnab is going to tell you about using uh, known drugs to try to rapidly deploy uh, potential therapeutics 
uh, to treat the, the coronavirus pandemic. So it's a real pleasure to introduce, and I'm going to pop off here and then let uh, Arnab share his screen. And then before we do that, or while he's doing that, I want to uh, just say at the end, we'll have a question and answer. And in your Zoom app down there in the little control panel, there's a Q&A. So you can type your questions into that Q&A. And, uh, and I'll be moderating the questions so that Arnab can give his full attention to the answers. Uh, so, so you can type your question in at any time, and we will try to go through and leave some time right at the end for a, a nice discussion. So Arnab, welcome, and I'm going to let you uh, take over. So uh, enjoy, everyone. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, appreciate the introduction, and it's a real pleasure. I hope everyone can hear and see me okay. Um, I, it's a real pleasure to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing in drug screening uh, here at Scripps and, and particularly at Caliber. I've had the pleasure of, of being at Caliber since uh, Caliber started eight years ago and, and even more delighted about the, um, about the you know, combination of Caliber and the Scripps and tell you a little bit about the work of what we're doing around COVID-19. Um, usually I'm smiling, so I don't know why I have my blue steel Zoolander face uh, on some of these uh, pictures, but uh, we are very excited about our work in COVID-19 and I'm happy to share some of the results we've generated just in the last uh, few weeks. Um, and, and going back a little bit further to some of the work we've done when the outbreak first started in Wuhan um, and made its way in East, uh, in East Asia before coming um, to the rest of the world. Um, so what I wanted to outline today was really how did this, um, how, what was the role of Caliber and Scripps in the context of what we were doing before the pandemic and, and how have we reacted and responded to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as it's posed as a global public health emergency. Um, really at the center of this is a, is a compound collection that we started building in 2015 with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which we call the Reframe Library. And in the Reframe Library, what we fundamentally have been able to do is, is, co is the concept of democratizing drug discovery. Um, the real idea there is that people with good ideas uh, should be allowed to freely test their ideas uh, with universal drug libraries. Uh, and being at Scripps uh, and being in the nonprofit group uh, world has allowed us to have a unique position to be able to build collaborations, uh, build bridges to people around the world in terms of our drug screening options, capabilities, sharing drug libraries, and really bring, uh, allowing people throughout the world to do that, uh, serving as a nonprofit institute. We've built li the Reframe Library as we believe to be a, a best-in-class drug repurposing library. I'll tell a little bit about that. You know, we casted a wide net here and we bought whatever we could, which is about 6,000 molecules. If you wanted to buy research grade drug molecules that have been in clinical trials or are already approved in clinical trials, one of those 10, 10 molecules that, that Jamie showed in his deck, you can buy about half of those and the rest you actually have to synthesize. And so we undertook a massive effort to be able to make those compounds uh, in the lab one by one uh, and synthesize them. Many of those compounds are the synthetic complexity of a, of a PhD uh, in chemistry. So a, a tremendous amount of effort to do that. And to do that at risk, uh, doing that before COVID-19 uh, and a public health emergency is something that, that I'm very proud of being involved in. And really finally going where the science is. So you know, the key aspects of this is you know, uh, being able to send the drug library quickly to Hong Kong in late January, uh, early February, when it was clear that this infection was going beyond Wuhan and what, beyond China, and being able to be able to provide the equipment and tools. And I talked about that at a front row lecture I was part of in June with Travis and Kristen, where you know, we actually not only sent the person, in this case as a postdoc, Melina Bukowski, who's actually also been instrumental to this COVID work, she, equipment, and the compounds all went to Southeast Asia and Thailand to run a screen on hypnozoite vivax malaria. And so going where the science is and enabling the rest of the community has been critical in this. Um, what we've learned from our COVID-19 work and what we've contributed is again, the same concept that drug discovery is hard and sharing compounds, sharing libraries, being able to get people what they need to be able to do things is, is critical. And we've been involved in that also all hands on deck. We've obviously limited ourselves at, at Scripps uh, to COVID-19 work uh, given the pandemic and really getting some of the best scientists in the lab, Molina, Tom Rogers, Case Magic, and 
showing all the names in the acknowledgement slide of people who have refocused their efforts uh, on COVID-19 from other things they've done. I think it's really critical to be able to do that to bring scale, uh, not only to the effort, but bringing the right people uh, and the right resources to bear. I'm happy to report that our screening at Scripps in HeLa cells, in human cells, uh, have identified seven approved molecules that most importantly can be used in combination, uh, as well as 16 other clinical stage molecules that have made it into human trials deemed to be safe enough to test in humans that appear to be active in our assay, and not only active in our assay, at drug levels where we believe that the compounds could actually be repurposed for COVID-19. And all of that leads to the world of drug combinations, as everyone is familiar with, multiple molecules are being looked at in the clinic. And for multiple reasons, we wanna be able to save drug supply, use the compounds that are the most critically available efficiently and effectively, limit the resistance of the virus from being able to only see one drug and, and much harder to be able to be tricked if you can add more than one drug. So simplifying that is critical. So that's really what I'd like to kind of cover today. Really, you know, drug discovery is a hard endeavor uh, and that's before a pandemic even shows up. So this is a slide I uh, borrowed from, from a close colleague of mine, Mike Petrassi, basically saying that you can get a drug to do what you want in a cell uh, is much less challenging for being able to do it safely and predictably in humans. So a lot of data we've seen in this potential pan in this pandemic has been data that needs further validation, further follow-up, and really many, many molecules, this is work published by AstraZeneca, that fail in phase two, which is essentially the stage of the clinical development where you determine if the molecule actually has an effect, not only safe enough, but has an effect towards the intended disease with a small number of patients. And that is really hard to do uh, and really, really critical in a double, file, double, double blind clinical trial to be able to pursue those sort of efforts. And so, you know, this is in a world where you have more time and more resources. And as you can see, a lot of things attrit. How do you do this in the context of a global pandemic? Well, you start with where the drugs are. And many times uh, we've looked at many, many different sources of drugs to be able to move them into clinical development. Um, part of what we've pioneered and others have over the last couple decades has been able to screen large drug libraries of many, many tens of thousands, up to even millions of compounds, be able to take things that are known from the literature, derive things from natural products um, that could be used and then repurpose drugs, which I'll tell a little bit about. And as we think about kind of going along the drug discovery pipeline, it's a long road, like uh, sailing down the um, Amazon River to go from a discovery molecule to something that actually can go all the way into uh, clinical trials. And the key point here is that antivirals have had to be discovered with very few starting points. In fact, when we look at antibiotics broadly, antiparasitics, anti and antibiotics and antibacterials, antivirals have typically had a relatively small amount of chemical space to be able to interrogate to find novel antiviral drugs. So it's particularly challenging for, for viruses, I would argue, compared to penicillins or, or other types of molecules, which you know are very potent antibacterials, or artemisinins or quinines, for example, that have been proven to be very potent antimalarials and antiparasitics. So how do we accelerate the drug discovery effort? We do this with the reframe and uh, compound library, which we call the repurposed re, uh, focused rescue and accelerated medchem initiative, which is that you find useful starting points by screening a small number of compounds. Many academic labs, other nonprofit institutes, and certainly for-profit organizations can screen 12,000 molecules. And, and this shows one example of that, uh, of, of a screening robot that allows you to do that. But even groups can screen a, a set of 12,000 compounds very readily. And that's been part of our approach for providing the reframe collection. But then in parallel to that, also generating a variety of different assays, one of which I'll talk about of screening the reframe collection ourselves at Scripps to find useful starting points for COVID-19 infection. So you may ask, what is reframe? So reframe is about 12,000 molecules. Uh, Alonzo there pictured is actually one of the folks in compound management, is instrumental in putting together the compound collection. This is an open resource and an open source database that includes uh, clinical information uh, as well as preclinical information. It was generated to be able to provide not only the drug information for the compounds, but also more importantly, provide all of the data around screening of these libraries. So that's that you can imagine each molecule, each 12,000 drug molecule that's been tested in a variety of different assays has its own unique fingerprint. What, what viral, viral assays did this compound work on? COVID-19 versus Zika virus versus another type of virus 
versus how does it work against malaria parasite or how does it even work against mammalian cells or something that's not even related to uh, anti-infective anti uh, drug discovery. And we've really established, as I mentioned, with the key and critical interaction with the Gates Foundation. So how do we d speed up drug discovery timelines and how do we make this whole process as efficient as possible? So the point of this slide is really to show that you can generate molecules very early in a drug discovery process. And I showed in some examples where we screen millions of compounds. And so you get through hit structures to then preclinical development, then clinical development, kind of stage two and stage three on the right-hand side. And really the critical aspect is the reframe collection allows us to get to the middle of this funnel very quickly. We can get into molecules that have already demonstrated preclinical development and can test those molecules quickly in animal models and in other disease models that allow us to understand the activity of those compounds more clearly. And then the clinical development could potentially come in at phase two directly if it's a molecule that we know works and works well at a point where we think we can go directly into clinical development can save many years, three to five years possibly, off of the development of those molecules to go into clinical development and to test what we call it phase two, which is the critical proof of concept stage. And then again, the other key aspect of the reframe library, which we've also been able to utilize for other infections, is we can use advanced leads that can be optimized. So we can find molecules that are good starting points where a lot of the attributes of the molecule are already known. And now we can optimize or make close chemical derivatives of those molecules and move those towards essentially a small number of compounds that can then get moved into the clinic. So how can Co Reframe have an impact on COVID-19? So in the world of um, remdesivir and other molecules, certainly you know, beyond remdesivir, hopefully to be able to come as approved therapies, you know, how can we get this work started? So I'm happy to report that we were contacted by Suma Chanda and folks at Sanford Burnham, but also at Hong Kong University, looking to screen the Reframe Library as early as the end of January. I think that was particularly important. I think it showed the ability to be able to move and apply the Reframe collection quickly in a scenario where we were not clear whether or not this was something that was going to be, have the sort of impact that we now know just a few short months later. And so we've been able to identify both in the screen that was done by Suma Chanda as well as the and Hong Kong University, as well as the most recent screen we've run at Scripps, showing potentially useful therapeutics based on cell-based screening, meaning finding molecules that simply kill the virus in a cell and moving those compounds forward into animal models and potentially into clinical development. Like I said, we were the first group to generate a high throughput assay, ones where we can screen tens of thousands of compounds in human cells and be able to do that. And the other key aspect of doing drug combinations is to limit resistance, or we know from the HIV epidemic, for example, is for our ability to, to limit drug resistance. The key aspect of this is really we want to be able to prevent disease, treat disease, as well as think about ways to disease prevention through a way such that we can administer a drug and be able to get extended periods of coverage, meaning that we can get the drug in a single shot or a single, in, in, or a single administration have the drug having a much longer acting profile. And so the Cates Foundation has been a key partner in this work. And certainly it's been both a local effort with folks here locally in La Jolla, and then a global effort is all kind of outlined uh, in the next few slides. So deploying and using this high resource library as a best in class repurposing library, our ask is very simple, which is we provide the library for free. Uh, all we ask is that folks make the drug molecule data publicly available. We have a portal that I'll show that describes all of that information. We also allow, require that if the molecule were to move forward, that the access to that molecule and the manufacturing of that molecule can be used throughout the world, both in low and middle income countries, not just in, in high income countries. The investigators are allowed to own the intellectual property from the screens themselves. So again, the key aspect is really actionable drug discovery uh, with limit, very few limitations to no limitations for the uh, investigators to pursue this work. And a unique approach to that is obviously providing these compound collection libraries as quickly as possible. They all kind of fit into a small duffel bag when you put all the plates together and ship it off to someone. And so the hope is that many, many groups, as I'll show, will be able to test this compound collection, make the data available, and I'll show some of the results of that work um, in the next few slides. So the interesting part is that only a small part of Reframe was actually initially developed as anti-infectives. In fact, only 14% of the compound collection 
uh, was generated as anti-infectives. And when you take that, the majority of that is actually antibacterials. So in fact, about eight to 10% of the compound library was developed as antivirals. But as I'll show in the subsequent screening data, we found non, non antibiotic drugs actually to be found to be, at least in cell based assays, useful against COVID 19 infection. So as we add more antiviral compounds to our collection and make the number even greater than 12,000, because we don't have every molecule, but we have many, many of the molecules we want to be able to test and be able to provide these to people. As you can see, the majority of these molecules have been in clinical development so they can get moved quickly into that phase two proof of concept study that I outlined earlier. So what have we done since 2018 when we first started uh, using the reframe library? We've screened it in many different assays, nearly 100 or so. It's actually grown even more so now. I'm proud to report that I'll show in the subsequent slides, we've actually moved things into clinical trials. We've also, for other diseases, we've also moved things into in, in vivo studies, meaning demonstrating activity in animal models of disease beyond what the drugs were initially developed for. Uh, and as I mentioned, our work with, uh, with Hong Kong University and Burnham has been recently published as a, as a preprint, and we're in the process of publishing the work that I'm going to talk about today, which has essentially been, which has been unpublished until uh, the discussion today to provide you guys a glimpse of the minute by minute update in terms of what we're doing here at Scripps on COVID-19 antivirals. So as an example, we've put in numerous preclinical compounds. We've actually put two things into clinical development that have arisen from Reframe. Uh, in fact, two clinical trials are ongoing. One is for Aranifin, which is a known osteoarthritis drug that's being used in tuberculosis in a clinical trial in South Africa, and clofazamine, which was discovered as a, uh, which is a known leprosy drug, so an antibacterial, that is useful against a, paras par a parasite called Cryptosporidium, which is now in a phase two trial in Malawi. And again, both of these programs are funded by the Gates Foundation and got them interested in how further can we expand the use of this library for COVID-19 infection. We have some even earlier stage things that are close to the clinic uh, that are addressing both uh, not only direct acting antivirals, but affecting the vectors. In this case, not a vector for COVID-19, but for example, Zika, or malaria where a vector is used, a mosquito, for example, is used to transmit the disease, as well as other molecules we found from a variety of other screens. So how do we apply all of these new ways of intervening uh, and new approaches and how can we impact a public health emergency? So really Caliber serves as a drug discovery hub. We're able to develop assays and do screens ourselves. We're also able to provide this collection to many investigators around the world. And so serving as that hub, but also being able to take all of that information uh, and, but, and make sense of it, but also be able to provide all the resources to be able to pursue all the hits and all the compounds that have come out out of other people's screens outside of Scripps and Caliber, but also within Scripps and Caliber. So this is really to demonstrate the, the broad network, again, that we've developed just in the last few months of labs around the world to really be able to address this. And that includes everything from drug screening capability to in silico drug screening capability, to even folks like at Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry who's actually synthesizing drug molecules for us to test. So it's been very powerful to be able to take the reframe collection, but also all of this collaborative network that happens really only within a nonprofit environment like Scripps to be able to go and build these collections together. So leveraging this global library is critical. And many parts of what we're trying to do with the virus, as I show in the lower right-hand slide, is centered around affecting the bio biochemical targets. So the specific targets that the virus encodes, uh, protease function, polymerase function, et cetera, but also how the virus is able to incorporate and use the host cell of mammalian cells and human cells to its own ability to be able to propagate and grow itself within the human body. And how can we use a variety of different assays to, to qu ask questions about all of those different processes in virus replication? So this is just simply an overview. We've provided the reframe collection to nearly 15 sites, actually growing by the day. It's in, in 23 right now. And, and really with expertise in virology, but also people who are interested in making a real impact uh, in COVID-19. We've been uh, amazed by not only the nonprofit sector, but also the for-profit sector in being able to put resources and in intellectual manpower and physical manpower to be able to work towards a solution for COVID-19 anti antiviral small molecule drug development. I've been very proud of being involved in that process. 
Again, as I mentioned, we're working closely with screening partners. We have smaller compound collections available. We have a subset of about 150 molecules of the reframe library for folks who aren't even able to screen 12,000 compounds uh, to, for them to be able to validate their assays, meaning understanding how their assays work, how reproducible is the data, uh, what's the conf how, how robust is the data they're generating, and having that partnership uh, has been critical. Uh, I'll talk about this later. We had a very close collaboration with Tom Rogers, uh, who's in, uh, in the Burton Lab and assistant professor at Scripps, and Melina Bukowski, uh, who's at Caliber to generate a very robust 3D4 well infection assay uh, using HeLa cells, which is a human leukemia cell that expresses the specific receptor on the outside of the cell that's used for virus replication called ACE2. And we have identified very, a variety of interesting compounds in this screen. Really what is important for us is being able to share this information so we can be able to come up with the right set of compounds in the uh, concept of drug combinations and to be able to limit resistance. Uh, and I think that's critical for us. Uh, there's additional work ongoing at Scripps. Christian mentioned all the epidemiology work. Mike Farzan, as I meant, is, uh, gave the previous lecture in the front row, is actually doing biochemical screens, multiple really nice biochemical screens uh, using the Reframe Library in Florida. And so really being able to proactively put all these efforts together uh, for this infection and then how to plan for the next infection is, is really where our minds are at. So in terms of whole virus infection assays, just the key point here is that we've been connected to some of the best labs in the world. At the very top of that list is the work we've done with Burnham and with Hong Kong University is around being able to use cells, either monkey cells or human cells or some other combination and look for virus replication and how can we limit virus replication. And many of these groups have been funded by the Gates Foundation. Several of these groups are, are groups that have accessed the library, uh, as, I, as, as I said again, as a, as, a, um, as a public resource to be able to, to run screens. And I'm, I'm happy to report that we have screening data now from several of these groups. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the screen from, from Sumit and from Hong Kong is actually now completed. Uh, from, their, from their screening approach. So I'll show a little bit of that data and then the screen that, that was conducted at Scripps. In addition to that, as I mentioned, many other groups are looking at the polymerase, the protease, other parts of the viral replication cycle, and how can we incorporate and use that information to not only say, well, what drugs work on the virus, but how do they work? And, and so uh, getting to some of the questions about how they do work, uh, some of these assays are kind of critical to that. And you'll see several folks doing both in silico screens and in vitro. Uh, biochemical screens along that lines, uh, and, and, and it's been a, a, an amazing group of folks to, to be working with uh, around the world asking and, and trying to address those specific questions. So you may ask, how do we, how do we provide all this information so folks can access Reframe for free? They uh, essentially contact us, and then we basically get a, need, a request for compounds. Uh, we provide compounds in many cases with COVID-19. We provide a compounds next day to people. Um, and, and be able to then, the key aspect for us is being able to share that information, all of the compound information, all of the drug information, where we actually got the compound from. So if you want to buy more material to test in some more assays or provide to another collaborator, we enable all of that information so people can see dose response data, people can see where we acquired the compounds from, they can learn about the history of that compound and what other assays it's been screened in. So one such example here is actually the assay that I mentioned uh, that we ran uh, that was run at Hong Kong University and then further followed up at the Burnham, uh, which is a, a COVID-19 uh, cell assay in vero cells. In fact, you can click on here and go to reframedb.org and see this information. This provides all the information about the assay, how is it conducted, what is unique about the assay, and also tells you about the potent compounds that came out of that screen. And again, this is open resource assay drug discovery information, critical for biologists and other people interested in screening the library. And here I show the footprint that you get, fingerprint you get, excuse me, of a specific drug. This is actually a molecule that, that hit in the Vero cell screen. This is a drug level view. You can actually see this compound was moved into uh, particular disease areas, where it is in clinical development, what the activity is in the particular assay. And if for this particular compound, there was no other compounds where the compound was active in dose response. So the data we have is around COVID-19 infection. Uh, IC50 is listed there. And then also more importantly, where did we actually get the compound from? So folks can ask the question of how do I find this compound? We can, and you have the chemical structures. So you can ask the question, what are related drugs that chemists like myself like to ask? What sort of related drugs in terms of chemical structure are there that may also have activity uh, for uh, using this compound and related uh, chemical neighbors? So from there, we're shifting now is to some work that was done by Molina and by Tom looking at a high content imaging assay of coronavirus infection 
in, uh, as I mentioned, the HeLa ACE2 system. They were able to generate a screen very quickly. This is a matter of weeks uh, from uh, inception of, uh, of what cell lines were permissive to the virus to be able to actually complete the entire screen on reframe. And without going into the details, the key aspect is they were able to find, not unexpectedly, the remdesivir, our GS5734, is highly active in this assay with a variety of other compounds that people have demonstrated have activity uh, against COVID-19 in cells. And then combining that work with being able to ask the key question of synergy or additivity, meaning how can you take two compounds, take less of them, but get the same effect of being able to reduce virus replication. And again, moving those into animal studies of COVID-19, but then also considering clinical development around COVID-19. So I'm gonna step back and say one of the key aspects of being able to determine if you have a useful drug or not is to ask the question about how do you select all the hits for the best possible drugs? And so remdesivir here is just shown as an example. This is in fact uh, data that was published by Gilead um, in, in a manuscript that they had in the subsequent investigators brochure, which shows that remdesivir is this black line. And so this is looking at concentration of drug in blood in plasma over a period of time. You can actually see the drug concentration, this black line here, the very steep, steep sloping line goes down very quickly. So the key question you can ask is half-life, meaning how long until you have to dose the drug again is critical. The EC50, or at what point the compound is actually active, uh, and, and at what point do your drug levels follow, fall below this line? And then another key aspect, which is this, what we call the volume of distribution on the right-hand side, is how much of the drug is actually in the tissues. And obviously, as we know, for COVID-19, lungs are critical for being able to get drug concentration. So how do we pick the right compounds at the right drug levels to get into the right place? That's the key question as we get all of this in vitro data where we screen you know, the 12,000 compounds in reframe. And so this set of molecules is actually a set of molecules that are all active in the HeLa cell-based assay. Uh, we've used hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir as controls. And you can see they have EC50s or the effective concentration at 50% of virus inhibition and the safe drug levels that are known, how long the drug circulates, and where does the compound go? Does it go into tissues quickly? You can see both remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine do work. And in fact, they also have EC50s, for example, hydroxychloroquine, while the EC50 is around 1.3 micromolar, the safe drug levels is about 1.7 micromolar, and the drug half-life is quite long. And then you look for selectivity. So you want to be able to inhibit the virus replication without inhibiting you know, the function of the normal cell by itself that's not infected. You can see a variety of approved molecules that work in this human system, being able to work in human cells, and limit virus replication at various concentrations. In fact, we've found, found several molecules that work not only well, but work at concentrations where you can achieve much higher drug levels than what you actually are required to actually inhibit the virus growth. So we're really excited about this. I was also happy to report that Ozanamod, which is a molecule that, that, that uh, Jamie mentioned, also works in this assay as well, and is now an approved molecule. Uh, from uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb and Celgene. So all of these molecules are approved molecules and could potentially be used for uh, COVID-19. And interestingly enough, all of these compounds are additive with remdesivir, which means that the compounds themselves work and they also can be, less of that compound can be used and less of remdesivir, for example, can be used and give a similar effect of full virus inhibition. So we're very excited about that as we do additional work around combinations. The other thing we found, both from the screen that was run in Hong Kong and the screen that's been run here at Scripps, is that we can use multiple other mechanisms that we know affect virus replication. So for example, proteases, which is one of the key functions of the virus itself from its own uh, genomic sequence, is able to uh, be inhibited by a variety of different protease inhibitors. So I showed a couple of protease inhibitors on the previous slide for hepatitis C and uh, HIV. And in fact, what you can also see is that a variety of other human protease inhibitors also work in these assays. And again, with good selectivity and with the ability to potentially get safe drug levels in animals and more importantly in humans to be able to inhibit this. And so now the key question is how do we move these into further studies where we're looking at animal models, we're looking at other uh, assays that can ask the question about, well, how does the virus work in other cell types, including lung cells, for example, beyond the leukemia cells that we've used for our initial screen, and then be able to consider how we could move forward uh, to move those compounds into further development. And then the next few slides just demonstrate some other molecules. These are not approved molecules, but these are molecules that have made it into the clinic, which again, have good potent activity 
against HeLa cells. Apilomod was one example I showed. This is a molecule that serves really as a control. Many people have shown this. But for example, you can look at quinine antimalarials. I showed one on the previous slide of halophantrine, but AQ13. Also very good exposure and the ability to inhibit the virus at concentrations that we believe can be safely reached in humans. So really excited about this and thinking about other potential mechanisms, right? Not just inhibiting virus replication through proteases and through known mechanisms, including the quinines, but for example, novel mechanisms would show potent activity against the virus and how those mechanisms may be involved. Many of these are kind of unexpected mechanisms. For example, is affecting spice, splicing of RNA could be a very interesting mechanism for this virus and something that you don't know until you do what we call, you know, you know, blinded screening, which means you screen everything and see what works and then figure out, you know, what the real drug combination there is. And again, additional mechanisms on this slide, just to again show not just the breadth of compounds uh, of the different mechanisms, but also the depth, meaning we're seeing multiple compounds from the same or similar mechanisms working in these models. So we're really excited about this data to use as a stepping stone to move into uh, further studies, uh, both in cells, animals, and then uh, essentially, uh, hopefully into humans. And as I mentioned, drug combination screening is critical to this. So, so this is an example of how you can combine two drugs and see if they work together. And the real aspect of this that I wanted to highlight is that you can use less of drugs. So you can actually use, for example, nearly 150 fold less of remdesivir and 66 fold less of apilomod compared to its safe drug levels and see complete virus uh, inhibition in cells. So it allows you to be able to save drug. It allows you to be able to get to profiles in vivo and in people where the drug levels can be lower, so the compounds are more safe for people. So for example, getting to mildly symptomatic and even potentially for prophylaxis for people that aren't even sick from COVID-19, giving them drugs that could potentially help the people who have active virus but don't have serious complications yet from the virus, as well as people who are uninfected right now but potentially could be facing a lot of virus either in their own household or as a frontline worker could be able to access these sort of molecules to be able to t use them in a way that they can, be, can, they can be efficient and effective. We focused a lot of our work on oral drugs. So as you'll saw, the seven molecules I highlighted on the approved side are all oral molecules. So they do not require injections. You can take those at home. You can take those at your own, at your own time, which I think will be critical for being able to not only have an impact in places like the US and other in Europe, but for example, in other parts of the world where you want to be able to get to many, many more people, uh, people who don't have access to hospitals to get IV infusions, for example, to be able to really be able to have an effect on COVID-19 infection. And we're now doing drug combination screens with these oral molecules themselves. And early data suggests that the oral molecules can be added to other oral molecules to be able to get really potent inhibition of virus. And so I'm really excited about that work that's ongoing now to demonstrate that you could potentially use two oral molecules and not have to use injectable molecules to potentially get to the same endpoint of being able to limit uh, the growth of the virus in patients and potentially use as prophylaxis. So this is one such example. Sometimes less is more when you combine two drugs. As I showed on the previous slide, you can use a large amount of drugs. So this is an example of con concentration of remdesivir. As you increase the concentration, you can get full virus inhibition. And with the pilamod only, you can get about 90, 85% reduction at these concentrations. But if you combine them and that you can go off of the dose of remdesivir significantly, you can get to almost complete inhibition, for example, at these two concentrations by using less remdesivir and pinching in a little bit of a pilamod as an example. But now we've done that with other approved molecules crossed other approved oral molecules. So if you could use a little bit of both, then you might be able to get the same effect versus having to use a lot of one drug. And that's important from a resistance standpoint as well. Eventually, if you just start using one drug on the virus, you will start getting mutation of the virus and then the drug loses some or all of its effectiveness. Very well demonstrated in antibacterial drug discovery and in HIV where you need to combine drugs to limit resistance and improve efficacy. And so that's really where we're focused on our work here at Scripps. In addition to that work, we're also thinking about how to move these works into animal models. Just a few of these are examples here. We're making material to be able to put into trials right now for in animals, uh, as well as thinking about potential human trials. And again, we're really excited about not only the things that work on the virus, but also on things that work on the host cell. So can you use a host cell mechanism that the host would be able to be more, uh, what I say, you know, ready to be able to clear the virus versus the virus tricking the host into being able to replicate its own uh, itself. And so being able to balance those two efforts is something I'm really excited about. And again, the key for all of this is once we have something that shows the level of data we're excited about, 
moving those into clinical trials quickly. And as I showed with clofazine and aranifin, we've been able to demonstrate that within uh, caliber and strips. And I think that's something that they were uh, going to be the next step for us in terms of our work on COVID-19. Combining drugs is critical and being able to have the in vivo assays that tell you not only does the compound do what it's supposed to in cells, but does it do it in an animal and what, that is infected with COVID-19 infection? Can you combine those two drugs to be able to do it? And that's something I'm also excited about. And we have, for example, hamster models of infection that allow us to very quickly ask the question of how quickly can we be able to address uh, if these compounds can work together, combining not only remdesivir, which is a, a intravenous agent with oral drugs, but also oral drugs with other oral drugs. So the last part I wanted to end up with is obviously we're very excited about the work we're doing on COVID-19, uh, exceptionally excited about the next steps here to be able to move our, next, our work forward. But as I showed at the beginning of the talk, we had a lot of things already ongoing for other diseases, malaria, TB, I would call HIV, other public health uh, large public health concerns, but how can we prepare for the next pandemic, something like this, uh, which you know many people will say is not a matter of if, but a matter of when, especially if, if you went to Christian stock, where uh, you know the possibility of being able to respond to these sort of uh, uh, pandemic sort of situations is critical. So what we're really excited about is being able to build a new drug discovery center, very similar to kind of what Christian outlined and, and uh, in terms of what we can do is to be able to build a drug discovery center that responds to pandemics. So expanding our ability to do biosafety level three screening, which is the required biosafety level for if you're dealing with COVID-19 infection or even tuberculosis, for example, be able to ahead of time screen all of the potential agents. If you had screened MERS and you had screened SARS-1, if you had screened all the other viruses, bacteria, parasites, et cetera, and had a fingerprint of every one of those 12,000 compounds in reframe, which how quickly you could address the next outbreak, we think is, is a highly critical thing to be able to do. Using reframe, working with pharmaceutical partners, working with for-profit groups to be able to answer those questions and build a robust network of partners around where we're at. You know, certainly as, as outbreak.info and from Andrew Sue's lab and Christian's lab has shown, the outbreak is fast, it's quick, and so how can we go from months or years of developing an antiviral? How can we potentially make it you know, weeks? Um, and so that's really kind of where we're, where, where we're interested in moving to next. Uh, and I think that's gonna be critical for us to have a, a lasting impact, not only on this infection and the screens and the things we've done here, but also looking forward uh, to the next outbreak and how as a nonprofit can we have that impact that has experience in developing drugs not just for as anti-infectives, but other areas of being able to solve drug discovery problems and move treatments into patients to address the most public, most urgent public health concerns. So with that, the final slide is really to thank a lot of people. Uh, it's been a tremendous effort of many, many different people involved in this work. Um, there are multiple people who've been involved in the chemistry side. I show some of them there. Uh, several of these people have actually come into lab uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and, and, and really rolled up their sleeves to make a tremendous effort on the screening. Uh, I mentioned Melina, Nathan, uh, and Tom Rogers' group have had a tremendous effort in the HeLa ACE2 work. Uh, I mentioned a variety of different people at Caliber involved in screening, but also putting all the compounds together and making the collections available, sending off compounds whenever they're needed, wherever they're needed, uh, and also very excited about the work we've done on the informatics side uh, at Caliber uh, with Andrew Sue's lab, and then the work that I mentioned with Sumit and Laura and his group at Sanford Burnham around the screen that, that started in Hong Kong and then finished up there. And also very happy of all of the tremendous support, input, uh, and intellectual uh, input into the work that we've done from the Gates Foundation. They have been an instrumental partner to this. And I think the vision is really how quickly can we have an impact uh, and being able to get some of these useful data that I had a chance to describe to you today uh, into patients and be able to address this concern. So with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions and thank everyone for their attention and time. All right, let's, uh, let's give Arnab a, a hand. Thank you very much. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, uh, one thing, I, I, maybe you could just comment on this again. I just wanna make it clear to everybody in the audience that, that you're doing state-of-the-art drug discovery, but it's in a not-for-profit setting, right? And, yes. And you know, you said a couple times that all of the information that you're coming by is made publicly available, and that's is that a condition of the support uh, by Gates? 
yeah, that is. That, that's not only a condition of the support from Gates, but I think it's a condition for us wanting to, to do the, all this work at risk, right? It's, it's, it's the, the cycle is, you know, the wait for the, don't wait for the, 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 the problem and the funding to show up, just roll up your sleeves and start doing it and, right. and ask questions later. So I think, you know, part of what, what we kind of tried to do uh, in January and February before this became a really big thing around the world was to provide those resources to people as quickly as possible, regardless of what they're doing. And I think that, that kind of open-mindedness to being agnostic to the disease and agnostic to who's doing the screening as a nonprofit, I think is a, is a unique capability. Right, that's really powerful, thank you. Uh, now, I, uh, we have a lot of questions people are typing in. I'm, I'm gonna maybe aggregate uh, some of them, uh, but, but one of the themes are people are kind of asking about using uh, anti-infectives, so antibiotics that hit, um, that, that, that hit bacteria in combination with uh, antivirals. And, and so what, what's that about and why, why is this a, a good strategy? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think you know, if you were to look at, for example, two mechanisms of the, that the virus uses, um, that the virus encodes, and let's just pick polymerase and protease as two such examples, you want to be able to combine because if, you, if, the, if the virus is only seeing one drug all the time, it's going to say, the, the only way I can survive Darwinianism is by mutating myself into something that, that actually overcomes this. And that's been reported, at least in vitro, against many drugs and many infections and clinically seen for many diseases and many infections. Uh, and so the real power, and you know, David Ho was listed on one of our lists, proud to have him as a collaborator at Columbia, you know, who kind of pioneered this concept for HIV, which is to use multiple agents together and to also potentially use agents that enhance the activity of other agents. So one of the key aspects is not only saying, well, we need to hit the virus from a, from a different couple of ways, there's drug combinations in HIV whose job is just to enhance the activity of one of the other drugs. And so that sort of drug combination effect is critical to being able to limit resistance, which affects the ability for this thing to get even crazier than it already is, but then also allows you to be able to save the amount of drug you use. And combining two drugs, even if they might be hitting the same mechanism, but in a distinctly different way at a biochemical level, can also be very powerful and something that I think event that we need to get to. And that's clearly something that, that we need to get to, not just coming up with better drugs, but how to make those drugs together. So uh, another theme uh, question is a, a number of people were wondering about, uh, you know, doing these screens in cell-based assays with, you know, these immortal cell lines compared to the, the real target, which is lung epithelium. Right. So, so what, how, how do you brand, uh, yeah. bridge that gap? In yeah, exactly. So that's about knowledge of the virus, right? So, so you know, the, 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 when people say novel, they mean it. So in, 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 in the aspect of that is that, you know, what are the biochemical processes that are required? We know about a few things. We know about ACE2. We know about this protease called Temperus2. We know about the spike protein. These have become household names of, of what the virus does to be able to, you know, infect and be able to do, to do what it wants to do. And so as we've learned about those processes, we need cell-based systems that at first are engineered in a way such that we can grow the virus quickly and be able to ask the question of, do any drugs work, right? Versus eventually what you wanna be able to do, which is to go into a cell-based system that has nothing engineered about it. It's just the cell, either it's a cell line from, uh, from, a, from a human patient, or it's a primary lung cell that's actually isolated from a person. And so that's where, as I mentioned, it also organoids, right, the concept of putting cells together in a, in a multicellular system that ex exempl it exemplifies the potential tissue better than any particular cell of its own origin could. And so all of those are ways we're thinking about how to select the compounds that are the best candidates in addition to the animal models and whatnot. So as we know more about the virus, we'll back off the engineering aspect of it, but to start somewhere, usually we need engineered systems. And generally that's been the way that, that we've started with these infections. And so the hope is that some compounds will drop out from that uh, process, but then some compounds will survive and be ones that we'll be even more excited about. So a, a number of people are kind of wondering what, you know, wh where do you go from here? So, so you're gonna get some hits, you've got some really promising uh, combination therapies. Uh, so does, do you envision those becoming candidates for clinical trials or do you think there will be medicinal chemistry so people will yeah. modify the drugs to, to further improve them? You know, right. what's, what's, what's the over under on, on those? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so I would say, you know, we're very focused on really putting our resources towards the things that could be tense tested in humans quickly. And I think that's part of what we're super excited about. And that, that's why I put that up as the first list of things is that if you could take GMP drug material and move those into clinical trials quickly with additional validation data, we could get something into patients quickly. And so I think that's where we're focused. The optimization of the molecules is something we're doing as well, because we, we at least we believe this infection you know, is going to be around with us long enough that considering moving a molecule through that longer pipeline, that longer trek down the Amazon that I showed, is something you still want to pursue because this infection will be around longer than just a few months. We are pursuing that as well, but I would say our most pertinent goal is how can we get oral drugs into clinical trials quickly, and that's where most of our focus is, though I think we've taken a longer-term strategy, not just for this infection, but as I mentioned, a longer-term strategy towards global pandemics um, as well. Now, there's a, there's a lot of questions from people that kind of have more epidemiological uh, questions. We can, we can take a stab at discussing <laughs> okay. some, of the, some of those, but um, it's, so one, one thing people are wondering about is the mutation rate of the right. virus. Yeah. Uh, so compared to other things, like for example, flu. Yeah. Uh, and then what, what are the challenges that viral mutation present to the programs that you guys are pursuing at Caliber? Right. So, so viral mutations yet about this virus are not very well known. There is some reports that in the lab people can generate viral resistance uh, to drugs, particular drugs in, in cells at least. Again, that has not been something that's been viewed uh, in clinical development yet uh, and in patients. But that's something that is not only a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So, so how does that rate compare to flu or to Ebola or other infections? is very hard for us to answer right now. So we're answering the if part of it, uh, and, and that is that it will happen. And no, no, you know, there is a classic example of, of, a, of, a, of an anti-flu compound, the first anti-flu compound approved in nearly three decades that generated resistance in patients within months. Uh, and so we're fully aware of that. That's, that's almost the expectation rather than you know, the, 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 the off chance. And so combining drugs for that is gonna be critical for us. Uh, that's a lot of where our work is kind of focused on. The nice part is a lot of the hits I showed are believed to not work on the virus targets themselves, but rather on the host. And so one of the key aspects of being able to address the host is that the host is the host and the host doesn't change. So if you can affect something that affects virus replication on the host, it can overcome the resistance. It can even save the drugs that are directly acting antivirals but it can also be the drugs that could be used against many different classes of viruses that may all use some similar mechanism that they use to infect cells. So we think the host approach has advantages to both resistance as well as broad spectrum activity. Okay, uh, we're coming up on our hour and uh, there's, we could go on, uh, Arnab and I could riff on this all, all afternoon, but I, I, I just think some people in some parts of the world have happy hour or dinner to <laughs> get to. Yeah. And, um, and uh, uh, Arnab and I have to go back to work. And I, the one thing I just wanted to add is that we, were, we weren't sure that Arnab was gonna show up on time because <laughs> he just got off a of Zoom with the Gates Foundation uh, where he was presenting the, the latest and greatest uh, so, so I, I don't, uh, Bill, Bill Gates is a ter terrific guy. He's doing some fantastic work to support all of this. Arnab is leading the charge here at Caliber. So thank you all for, for tuning in. I'm sorry I can't get to everybody's questions, uh, but I do hope you'll join us again. We're going to continue to, to do this. I, I just want to leave you with the thought that, that we have a deep bench at Scripps. We really have all kinds of people doing, uh, attacking every aspect of this problem in addition to all the basic research that goes on. So uh, I wanna thank uh, KPBS who has sponsored this webinar and uh, also to our many donors who have supported Scripps over, over the years. And uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, I th hope you'll agree that this is a worthy cause and we're putting your dollars to work ex in a fantastic way. Thanks, Arnab. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for joining me. And uh, we hope to see you at the next front row. Goodbye. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.